Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. Hey, everyone. I'm Chris. Good day. I'm Jesse. Good day. I was trying not to make it like time so you don't know. You're trying so, to make it awkward. Ah, is I was, was going to say good, good evening, morning. but you yelled at me last time when I said good oh. evening. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I didn't yell at you. Uh, I don't really care. Ahoy hoy. Ahoy hoy. Ahoy hoy. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast, everybody. How yeah. is everyone doing? Hope you're having a great day. We're doing pretty, or, pretty or well evening. over here. Or evening. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, we got an action-packed episode for you, but, uh, but I guess... Uh, before we get things uh, started here, let's pay the bills. Yeah. All right. So have you ever had a word formatting issue? We all have, right? We've all used Word. We all use Word. Word is, you know, more or less ubiquitous in the realm of digital typing. Like <laughs> documents. Digital <I> typing. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> in the world. In the world. The word. Word processors. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you're a typewriter and you've gone digital. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, the hard returns and things like that. You know, Is your abacus giving you problems? <laughs> <laughs> Check Trade out this in. Casio. <laughs> anyway, back to your word formatting needs. The formatting formula can handle anything that you can throw at them. They do... Um, all kinds of crazy wacky stuff. I was just talking to the formatting formula the other day about uh, they have these uh, templates and uh, there's the sidebar thing, like the navigation pane and they can update your navigation pane to, to uh, be updated with all the latest versions of word and how you track documents and all this crazy stuff they were telling me about that. I had no idea. Like I, you know, most of my word documents are, either gigantic and they're like 50 pages and I really need help or they're like two pages and I really need help. So <laughs> uh, thank goodness we have the formatting formula to go to. So uh, the formatting formula can take care of your needs for you or they actually have a YouTube channel, YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula where you can teach yourself how to format stuff. So um, check them out. Let them know that the Geology Flannel Cast sent you, and they will, um, I don't know, be happy that they're still advertising with us, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, I'm sure if you tell them that the Flannel Cast sent you, they will hook you up with a sweet discount. You tell them Steve said so. And <clears throat> please, again, check them out, formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. And thanks for listening. I guess. Um, fun little, I looked this up while you're doing the commercial. Fun little side note, Steve. <laughs> did you know the first word processor came out in 1979? It was the Word Star by MicroPro International Incorporated. Yeah, I had a Word Star. Really? No. I guess oh. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 79. That's. Uh, yeah, I was one. You're Ty yeah. <laughs> typing away, <laughs> <laughs> hammering away at that keyboard. Yeah, Curs cursing about formatting. If only uh, formatting formula was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you guys have word processors? I've seen them. I didn't. No. <laughs> no. We. I, yeah. I, I. I'm of the generation. I, I knew what it. I knew what it was, but. Uh, I had one, uh, and it was, like gigantic. It was like a gigantic electric typewriter mm -hmm. with this little tiny LCD yeah. screen, and you could type a bunch of stuff and make sure it was correct, and then hit print and then it would just like type it away yeah it was really cool um the good old days like that. yeah back in the day you had to use a typewriter and you couldn't screw up i mean how often do you do you screw up when you're writing in uh in microsoft word now you know oh all the and, time and my spelling is imagine. atrocious oh my god mine too yeah. yeah yeah i mean when you're spelling it and it like auto corrects i i still you don't know how many times a day I right click to try to find the word that I was trying to spell. <laughs> oh yeah. I just, so I, I'm sometimes I'm not even trying. I'm just mashing the keyboard and I'm like, it'll correct itself. There you go. I but still to this day tell myself I before E except after C <laughs> like little rules like that. Yep. 
All right. Well, that was a <laughs> yeah. That was a fun little trip down memory lane. Typing. <laughs> ah. ah. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again for writing for me. We we love you. We appreciate you, and uh, we love everything you do for us, both financially and in word. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to say the website? Formattingformula.com. Oh, there you go. YouTube forward slash C for, forward slash formatting formula. Check them out. There you go. Yes. Okay. Um, so we got some, uh, today we're just going to be talking about some, some news stories and doing a little geologic lesson, kind of some background information with some of these uh, news stories and how they, how they tie in. Um, which, who wants to start off first? Well, let, let's, let's throw it out there. Uh, you know, we do all these news stories. We do all these uh, current events. You know, sometimes we pick topics and go to town. Uh, but we're always up for some listener questions. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we haven't done a uh, – I've, I've actually been pretty bad at uh, telling, telling the listeners out there to submit listener questions. Uh, so, every once in a while – we haven't done it in a, in a long time, but – Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong. The Patreons, if you're a Patreon, you get to submit stuff and we get to, you know – Hey, I want you to do a topic on this. So if you if you really want to focus and hone in on something specific, become a Patreon, and yeah. then and then we have to, you know, we're le- <laughs> legally binding. I, I, I think. <laughs> no legal expert, but I am no. I am no. I'm just a caveman <laughs> who likes rocks. <laughs> yeah, that is a good reference. That's a late '80s SNL reference. There you go, really caveman nice. lawyer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, so send us in some questions, please. Yeah, and it, it's always fun. We play. Uh, we'll play stump the geologist uh, with your questions. We'll take a look at them and uh, answer them live. Not live, uh, but we'll answer them on on a podcast episode. So, uh, how do you submit the listener questions? You might be asking. Go to our website, geologyflannelcast.com, dot com, and uh, just click on the link, uh, listener questions, and there's a little form you can fill out. So. Send your questions away. Try to stump us. We'd like to do a uh, a uh, uh, listener questions episode coming up in the right. yeah in the relatively near future. It'll be fun to do that again. So um, yeah, so if you get a chance, if there's anything that keeps you up at night, you just you know you can't fall asleep, and you're just like, why geologically does this process happen? We're here. We're here to help you out here at the Geology Final Cast. <laughs> every night. That's me every night. <laughs> your personal geologist at your beckoning call. All you have to do is just send us an email. So I'm just laying in bed and I'm like, the plate is moving under me. It's just not right. It's, it's not. Yeah. Anywho. All right. All right. What, what do we got this evening or this morning or this afternoon or whatever time it is? <laughs> you want to you wanna start off with the, the thing that just, just happened? Yeah. Not me. But oh. Oh, <laughs> yeah. who's got that story? I don't have that story. <laughs> well, you, you, got, you know, it's the space dust, but I'll mention just if you were unawares, um, NASA uh, just landed basically a, a satellite called Osiris Rex on the asteroid Bennu. I think it's Bennu. And they basically touched down on the, the surface of the asteroid. For like six seconds, it just like impacted it, and that impact kicked up dust and debris that that got it. They they sucked into the the satellite, and now the satellite's on its way back to Earth. How cool is that? So First of all, really neat. Osiris Rex sounds like a fish song, uh, <laughs> but. Second of all, they, <laughs> it does, they essentially, it does. where did that name come from? I'm, I'm on the website right now. Well, I'll, I'll post on, I'll make a note right now. I'll post the, the NASA page for Osiris Rex. They have a little video, a quick little yeah, that, several that, second video showing, kicking up the dust. Exactly. They essentially sent a Dyson vacuum cleaner up to the satellite, <laughs> landed, it for, landed it for a hot minute and, and then took off. So, so Osiris, so it's, it's an acronym for uh, origin, spectral interpretation, resource identification, security, and Rex is re- regolith explorer. But Osiris is the Egyptian god of the uh, sun, dead, the underworld. The dot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right. Raz. The Raz. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah so it sounds even more like a fish song. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Rex is Latin for king. Oh, 
Duh, I'm I'm on the website. It's the first thing in bold. I didn't even see it. I'm like, oh, I wonder what that stands for. It's, <laughs> it's the, literally the first line on this website. I just saw it now. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, Bennu apparently is a. It poses a. It's a neo, so it's a near Earth object. Okay. It poses um, a threat to Earth in 2170. It could. Oh uh, boy. Could there's a one in a thousand chance it'll hit us. Do we know how big this thing is? Sure do. We just landed a satellite on it. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's bigger than a satellite. It is. <laughs> okay. So okay. Good. It is. Um, it's about half a kilometer, uh, half a cubic kilometer. It's, it's almost like 500 by 500 by 500 meters. Okay. Uh, so. It's the, Bor the Borg is coming to get us. Yeah, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> pretty, pretty decent size. It would cost, Five football fields it next would cost to each other. Regional, regional damage. It wouldn't be an earth killer, but uh, it would it, suck. It would yeah. suck. certainly You're, be a bummer if you were in the area. Let's see, something that big. If you were within like 100 miles of that, you wouldn't be having a good time, right? It, You'd yeah. be dead. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if it hit the ocean, if it... There, well, because that thing hits the ocean, you got a huge tsunami, and the Earth is three quarters that water. Also, it depends on it depends on the angle it hits and the, the depth that it hits, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and what what the target rock is, and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, it's um, lots of variables. <laughs> lots but of it, variables. But, but I, I would assume that if you're in a hundred miles of that, yeah, so you might not die instantly, but it. You. I'm doing a I'm doing an impact simulator right now to see. Just uh, oh, one of our Patreons says they have to do a fact check to see if its rotating mass is going to throw it off course. Ooh, uh oh. So we oh. are um, <clears throat> we we the collective we mm -hmm. NASA is they have a mission that's going to in two years. It's called a kinetic impactor, and so it's one of these mitigation methods if there is <clears throat> one of the ideas is if we see an object that's going to run into us if we go up there and just sort of hit it it'll bump it just enough to knock it off its orbit <clears throat> and we're going to test this idea and, and and there's a it's going to i don't know if it, it launches next year but it's going to it's going to kinetic it's called the kinetic impactor so it's basically just going to run into it's got some density to it it's going to run into the object to see if it will dramatically alter its course. So that's got to be really the math behind the engineering and behind <laughs> that. It's got to be just ridiculously bonkers. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just figure there's like a, a Nelson esque character from The Simpsons at NASA. <laughs> like, why don't we just run something into it? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> NASA's like, all right, I'll try it. Yeah, that sounds about right, right? So, oh my gosh, just because you got to imagine these things are moving at tens of thousands of miles an hour. Yeah. So and sorry. your margin of error is just, yeah. you can't screw up for something, you know, for something like that. Have you guys ever heard, uh, uh, have you guys watched the Phil Plate TED Talk about, he talks about what we would actually, what we would do if we found an object coming towards the earth? Oh, oh, it's it's kind of an old. I think it dates back what year? Oh, so it goes back. He did it in um, 2011, and uh, this guy, uh, his name's Phil Plate. He does a lot of like uh, scientific um, outreach yeah, he, work. He's he was a, called Bad. He was he does this. He does a a column. He does it for Sci-Fi.com now. It's called Bad Astronomy. Oh, okay. Because he was on Slate, right? Yeah, but he's and, yeah he's on sci -fi. He oh, okay. Who did he? I want to say he like he studied under someone like he he's a smart dude. Um, Carl Sagan? No, he got his PhD at Virginia. Ah, doesn't matter. But what were you saying about his TED talk? Oh yeah, so he talks about like what you so if there's an object that's coming, it's on a collision course with the Earth. Like the one thing that you don't want to do is the one thing that they won't do is send up like a nuclear bomb right because it's just the you know the, you gotta think the the 
the bomb will be coming away, it'd be moving away from Earth. This, uh, the object would be moving towards Earth, both at like, you know, I, I don't know, however fast they move. It's really, really, really fast. And th this is the precision that you would have to th detonate that nuclear bomb. It's, it's you basically, it, it, you, we pretty much can't do it, right? And then all that would do is it would just make more pieces that would hit the earth and it, you know, but that's always, he jokes around. That's always like Hollywood's answer for, you know, in all these movies, whenever something's coming towards the earth, Oh, just send out a nuke and blow it up. Right. Mm -hmm. So he said what they would actually do is they'd send something up and it would have to have this thing. You'd basically park it next to the impactor as a, a, that would be coming in. So obviously the further out you are, the better off you are. Right. So say if we have, we fig find something and we say, okay, we have seven years. All right, cool. Let's brainstorm. We got some time. You know, we don't have much time, but, you know, we, we got some time. It's not tomorrow, right? But what they would do is send something out there and basically try to uh, park it next to the impactor coming in, right? And they would just try to use gravity to nudge it away, right? Yeah. So you'd, set, you'd have this probe sitting next to it, and it would just very, very, very slowly start moving away from the asteroid and just the gravitational pull between the probe and the asteroid would, would, uh, it would change the course of the asteroid. And so you have to be so delicate with this. You can't use chemical rockets. You have to use something called an ion drive. And it's about, it releases about the force of a piece of paper hitting, hitting, a, hitting the floor and just ever so gently move it away. And it, it could nudge that, that asteroid potentially off course. True, but that would take a lot of uh, for time. Yeah. So you and it need to, be easy. you would need and to it's identify. Not like, oh, yeah, we got this like ready to go. Like no, no but you would need to identify this object that's in our path years in advance. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Have, but if we find it. out weeks to months in advance, we're gonna blow that thing up. We're gonna do the Hollywood version. You know it. You know it's coming. <laughs> we're just going to send up nukes. We're going to miss it. Or we're going to hit it. And no matter what, it's going to be bad. Send Space Force after him and it'll be... Yeah. Let's do it. Anyway. Uh, all right. So, uh, speaking of cosmic rays <laughs> or things in space, uh, I have a quick news story. You guys want to jump into this real quick? Yeah. yeah. Let's go for it. All right. So... Uh, plate tectonics. You heard of it? Once or twice. Yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of important. Right. So we have mountains forming and we have erosion and you have rivers eroding mountains, which is a no brainer. We all kind of like or der, know about this, mm -hmm. but there's these researchers in the journal science advances, uh, precisely captured the dynamic, uh, dramatic erosional effects, rainfall, has on sculpting peaks and valleys over millions of years. Okay. And again, it's like, well, didn't we already know this? <laughs> we, we did know this, but it really wasn't quantifiable how much uh, the rain and erosion affected the topography of mountains. So what these researchers did is they actually analyzed, so when cosmic particles bombard the Earth's surface, they can actually hit atoms and change their element they, they can change it from one element to another they can knock out a proton and change it from one thing to another thing so when this happens uh that like a grain of sand can actually change from one thing to this more rare other thing and they know the constant rate of these cosmic particles that are coming and hitting bombarding the earth and then what these researchers did was study the sediment at the base of mountains and calculate how long the sand has been there based on these cosmic rays and this, uh, this whole process. So for the first time, they can uh, calculate how rainfall affects erosion in a rugged terrain. Wow. So I, again, I had... Something so basic as the rivers eroding mountains, you just kind of take it for granted. Who would have even thought to study this? Kind of blows my mind. But uh, these researchers, you know, basically can quantify and it strongly supports the notion that 
ast- atmospheric, why can I say that? Atmospheric and solid earth processes are actually linked because of this process. So go ahead. Well, yeah, it's, you know, mother nature has no problems wearing down or eroding down mountain ranges. And, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit last week about, about mountain ranges eroding down, but you know, I'll rephrase it again this week. Mother nature hates topography Mm -hmm. or she, she hates topographic highs. Well, she, she she hates, she wants everything to be flat. Actually, let me rephrase that. She doesn't even like big, big depressions or big basins. She wants to fill that up. You know, she wants everything to be be uniform. When it's topography, she's working with gravity, and that's a bad combination. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so let's get to it. Flat Earth. Here we are. That's, <laughs> we really need to stop mentioning <laughs> that for, for this podcast. Yeah. Uh, so, but what's interesting is that the, these, these mountains from plate tectonics are being brought to the surface, and, and they're bringing these, um, some of these deeper elements like molybdenum or selenium that are actually like nutrients for life. So they're thinking without these cosmic ray, just this whole, they're thinking of this whole process in a much, much bigger picture and trying to calculate what, how the atmosphere and the, uh, I guess, plate tectonics, how they're interacting with each other. And they actually could have bigger implications for how there's actually life on the planet. So, pretty, so you're pretty, saying there's other s- multiple systems are working with each other in I unison? I know. You're saying they're connected? Exactly. I, again, it's this like erdur moment. Like I can't believe somebody even studied this, but they're actually putting quantifiable numbers to it and proving that the erosional rate of, you know, essentially rain and rivers on mountain systems equates to this and how how it all feeds back into the same system. So cool. Very cool. Uh, it, you know, it, it struck this article just struck me because it's like, I don't, I, I, this is so basic. I can't believe that somebody's looking into this and studying it and quantifying it. So it, it's just a cool way to think about how and, and cool way to study it and quantify it. So, you know what, that reminds me of, uh, I got a little side note story to tell, but when back when I was doing my, my PhD work, I remember I had a, a phone conversation with my, with my advisor, my major advisor, and we were talking about this one model that we were going to put together based on, based on the research that I was doing. And I was just like, I don't know about this, man. Like, this just seems like too basic. This seems like, 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 like you were saying, Steve, like, duh, like, of course, like, come on. Like, that's, that's how this, this thing works. And I remember my advisor saying like, Oh yeah, it's so basic that nobody's ever published on it. And I was thinking like, you got a point there. Like it's just like one of those things like you kind of just take for granted, I guess, but um, you know, but someone's got to come out there. And that, that honestly, like the other thing is I find that some of the most profound uh, discoveries in science are just sitting right in front of your face. They're so obvious that no, once again, nobody looks at it. Everyone's don't, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Octum's razor, right? Cut out. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I was just going to, you know, cut out, cut out all the garbage and just, you know, s- simplest thing tends to be the, the best answer. That's, I mean, I have that story where <clears throat> a year or two ago when I was, <clears throat> there's certain numbers that people just know <clears throat> that are sort of common, just common numbers. <clears throat> and, and, you know, one of them was just this, isotope value i'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of it but i put in this paper and one of the reviewers was like why did you use this number and not the number that everyone knows i was like oh first off it's you know we're just it's 100 million years ago i could say whatever i want uh (laughs) but uh part of it was just because it made it easier for me to do the calculations Mm -hmm. uh and I, I was I was talking to some of my co-authors, and they're like, "Well, you know, use that number." And I was like, "But why?" They're like, because that's the number. And I was like, "All right, um, where's that?" You know, and I'm, I'm and I knew the number, and I ended up going back and looking through. Like, I was like, "Well, what's the source of that number?" And like, 
sort of getting down a rabbit hole. Of yeah, know, right. Dangerous, sort of very dangerous, right? And it turns out it like it, it was mentioned once in a paper, you know, 45 years ago mm-hmm. from, from a, you know, 60 million years earlier after my time period, but everyone uses it. And mm-hmm. it's just everyone always cites the paper, but I don't think anyone actually ever. It, that's that's the one one huge problem in science is sometimes you get these things that everyone just kind of takes this fact as gospel, and it's just like not a, like you know you still you know that, as a scientist you still need to keep on questioning things, and sometimes you know we get a little lazy with that. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask you a question: How many glasses of water are you supposed to drink in a day? We Eight. talked about this on the podcast, before. right? Eight. And it's all because some some doctor sometime in the 40s referenced that you should drink eight glasses of water with no research behind it, just saying like <laughs> yeah. you should drink more water. And now everybody touts that stat that you should drink eight glasses of water because everybody refers back to, mm-hmm. well, this paper mentioned it and this paper mentioned it and this paper <laughs> mentioned it and this paper mentioned it, but you trail it all the way back like Jesse did. And it turns out like, no, it's kind of baloney. Like, yeah, we all need water, but <laughs> there's no scientific method behind why it's eight glasses for an adult human as opposed to two or 12. That's, I mean, the same idea between uh, with uh, MSG. Like, Did you listen to This American Life? I heard it start, but it was funny because <laughs> I was just about to talk about that. I was just reading. Did you listen to it? Cause you could. Yeah. Yeah. But I was listening to it in the background and I didn't like, I didn't yeah. find out if it was like a bunch of BS or if it was like legit. No, it, I mean, it is. And I remember like, because I had just heard something else, you know, recent in the past like month or two about how it's, there's no, there's no problem with MSG. Like it, mm-hmm. it's all. I, I have a question. Do you think This American Life is talking about the geology flannel cast right Absolutely. now? Absolutely. <laughs> Ira Glass is listening to this right now. Yeah. They don't, they don't talk about us on air because they don't want to give us That's true. extra coverage. Thanks for listening, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, yeah, so there's, the, uh, there's a recent, if you listen to the podcast, uh, This American Life, there was a whole episode uh, or they did one of the stories in one of the recent episodes was about how uh, some people went in or geez, no, nah, I'm going to screw it up. I, it was all about M, is MSG really bad for you or not. And it's just like monosodium kind of, glutamate. Yeah. It's just, it's like a yeah. spice or something. And it, you tend to, it's, it was, it's essentially it like salt. one guy. Yeah. And one guy wrote that every time in like the fifties, he wrote a letter to, the New England Journal of Medicine, and, and he was like a doctor, but he pretended to be a different doctor. Like, he, wasn't he like... Yeah, he trolled, he, he, he basically trolled the, he trolled and the he, journal. And he said, like, every time I had Chinese food, I get a headache afterwards, and I don't feel good. Mm-hmm. And so it led to this whole thing, and you'll still see it today, like, no MSG. Like, on yeah. the but, uh, yeah, but then they found out that he was a troll. He made the, yeah, he made the whole thing up with yeah. the... The headache and yeah yeah it's really really wacky but see i was listening to it in the background i was like well what's the truth then and i just <laughs> so i don't i don't know but anyways yeah so that's just a kind of funny little anecdotal story about i don't know some some of these facts so yeah ch- check your facts check yourself before you wreck yourself that's good good uh life advice there you know uh, you know oh, we're told uh msg is a meat tenderizer Mm. all right Thanks, there you have it all right should we, um, um move on to the next story yeah do you want me to do you want me to save you want me to go real quick and then you save yours or do you want to go it's up to you, you. doesn't i've got th- i've got three but i can do them bang 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 real quick all right let's get them over with go ahead I get them over with i'm just gonna put myself on mute and take a little nap <laughs> there you go every like i do every time you have that cardboard um, cut out of yourself. You just pop that in front of the camera and yeah. walk away. Yeah. Done. All right. Three rapid right. fire stories. Here we go. All right. I got three stories. Story number I'm one. Thinking. Yeah. I, I did. I would like to say, here I am saying a rapid fire. <laughs> here we go. In the beginning. <laughs> um, I, I've been on a big space kick and I feel like you earlier when you're like, no more space stories. Uh, well, what happens is I noticed what happened to me was I would click on the space stories and then my Google search would just kick back more space stories. There's a lot going on up there. Well, there is. In, I'm sorry. Continue. 
Uh, when you're apparently wide NASA has a, open. NASA has a big uh, announcement about the moon next week. Press conference about the it's moon. Made of cheese. Yeah. Because they have this uh, telescope that's on a, it's a modified like 747 that flies at like 60,000 feet or something. And <clears throat> because it's high, it's above most of the atmosphere. And apparently they, I don't know, it's all an alien or something. Uh, so oh, okay. That's good. Stay tuned for next Monday. I'm sure it'll just be like they found ice or something. <clears throat> they always make a big to do. Uh, no offense. <laughs> they they got to justify their funding. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so anyhow, I'm staying on Earth today. I got three play tectonic stories. All right. First, uh, <clears throat> there's this ties in with our Farallon plate idea. So, when the Farallon plate was subducting um, <clears throat> in the Cenozoic, yeah, in the Cenozoic, in the early Cenozoic, there's some thought. So, there was another plate with it that was subducting as well called. Um, uh, begins with a K. In cool. case you haven't listened, we talked about the Farallon plate last week, but the Farallon plate was a, it's an oceanic plate, right? Yeah, it had to be subducted. Yeah. So, duh. Um, it's an oceanic plate that got shoved, it subducted or got shoved underneath uh, North America. It collided with the west coast of North America and got shoved underneath the continent. So, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the Kula plate. Um, thanks, Frank. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, Patreon Frank saving me here. The Kula plate. Um, <laughs> was was working with the, the, the Farallon plate and, and also subducting. So there's some thought now that there was actually a third plate in there. Was subduct- it the Hada plate? <laughs> no, no. All right, I'm just going to disconnect this call. <laughs> Let's call it. The, the Come on, it was the Kula plate, not yeah. Hada plate. Anyway, uh, carry no, on. They did give it a pretty sweet name. They're calling it Resurrection. Oh, uh, <laughs> this like is a pretty sweet. Yeah, movie. right. So, so, was that the name of an alien movie? Alien Resurrection, right? Yeah. 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 All right, continue. Um, the resurrection plate. The resurrection plate is, it, they think it's subducted basically between the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. And um, they, um, they, they, they basically, they're using tomography to, to map this. So it's like, it's using uh, it's it's using basically se- they're using seismic waves to to look at what's going on in, in the subsurface and so we map mantle tomography it's similar to like a CT scan right when we're looking at mm-hmm. yeah the, the topography so is the North American plate just smuggling a bunch of other oceanic plates underneath it? Like, just hanging out. That's what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and basically when they, when they model it and they pull it back out, it sort of maps up with, with some ancient volcanic belts you find along that, that boundary, which would make sense. You're subducting, you're going to get them. So kind of cool that, that there's this other sort of subducted. One of the cool things about it is basically it, it like they, they're saying it, it started subducting and then it actually started moving sideways before it actually went down. And um, so, wait, wait, so, okay. So it starts going to the East, right? Collides with the West coast of North America, right? It's yeah. Going in the easterly direction. And then are you saying then it starts moving like to the North or South, like sideways? Yeah. Something? I don't, I didn't get a good sense of, um, or does it start to rotate? Which or... direction? Yeah, because they're saying it, it lines up with volcanoes on Alaska mm-hmm. and Washington State. Okay. Canada, okay. You're just ignoring Canada. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting and it's it's sort of new. It was just published recently somewhere. Um, GSA Bulletin. Okay. So, okay. so um but I'm not going to say anything else about it. Yeah, literally just came out on the 19th. So. I'm always amazed how, just as a science, we can we can reverse engineer plate tectonics going back. Because I, I was just watching the there's YouTube videos on there. You can see uh, the movement of the 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 plate movements over the last like one and a half billion years. Yeah, that's um, just the wildest thing to watch how the how the different plates are have been moving around and then um, it's pretty cool once it gets closer to modern time you can start seeing stuff and it's like all right 
all right, that looks, I can see, I can see where this is going now, you know, and it's, um, so, yeah. I have a question. Is our tomography and these plates that we're seeing, is it just based on our amount of instrumentation? And if we were to look underneath continental plates everywhere else, would we find these dead, you know, plates under other continents? Or, or are we just special here yeah, in North America? No, I mean, I, I would, I, I don't think we're. We are pretty special. We are, but that's what I'm saying. Like, is it, is it, we're finding all this stuff out just because of the amount of data points we have based on our seismic right. arrays and all this, you know, all, all the instrumentation that we have in North America. If we were to pick, I don't know, Australia or Africa or, or Europe or something like that, would, would we also be finding yeah. these dead plates underneath other continents. I don't, that's a good question. I'm, I'm looking at the actual paper now, and there are some pretty images mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the supplemental materials. Anywho. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have no an answer, answer for you, Steve. Uh, I don't have an answer. Probably. I would say my gut would say likely, yes. Yeah. But uh, I have no evidence. That's so. also what I would say. I would, yeah. Yeah. We're it's it's sort of like we're always we're always learning new things. Did you hear they they just found this new gland that's a, 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 a new bubble. organ? Yeah, the new organ. Yeah, yeah. That's in the that's in our own body. Gosh. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, there's like a new organ. It's like the series of glands in the upper part of your mouth. They just discovered that. Uh, makes no sense yeah I mean, it, it does make sense it's just just no found it. <laughs> it's just that's just crazy i i think uh, I, I didn't look into it but it looks like it's really really small though so here's a uh, frank frank our patreon has a great analogy for this he just uh sent a message he said we have the tech and you know is it it's just where we're looking he said it's it's where the street light is located so you can only see where the light is right and if the street light's not there, it's in the dark. Yep. And so we're, you know, we we're looking in these areas, but yeah, I I, I would bet. All right, let's what? do it. Let's build some seismic arrays in some faraway land and find these dead. Well, like you think about, like on the on the east, even like on the east coast of the U.S. Um, you know, during the the during the Paleozoic era, the three mountain building events that happened on the east coast of the U.S. Um, the first one, the Taconic mountain building event or the Taconic orogeny that was that was that had to do with subduction zones yeah. and volcanoes and so there probably is you know I mean I wouldn't be surprised if they found something underneath yeah, the east coast of the U.S. from uh, Avalonia yeah yeah that's uh well there was a big program a couple of years ago and I think it, it's probably still going it was called earth cube where they had an array earth is not a cube Prove, prove me wrong. No, <laughs> go to space yeah. and prove me wrong. The array that was moving across the country. Yeah, they they yeah. had this array of seismometers that they would set up in you know from from top to bottom, north to south of of the U.S. And they would just hang out for a set period of time, and then they would just move them to the east. And they moved west to east across the U.S. And they're just getting like this sort of complete picture of of the U.S. It's that's so cool. it was a really neat program. Um, yeah. I never heard of that. Earth Cube, huh? I think, I think it was called Earth Cube. I'm almost, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it was called Earth Cube, but I, I remember that, that moving array that would start. It started at the West Coast, and it was moving east. And This was probably yeah. a decade ago. Um, and it was recording, you know, fairly high-resolution data. And I, I want to say, you know, some of them were even into Canada and maybe – down into mexico um but i that that i could be wrong but it was it was at least the north to south border of the united states mm, okay yeah um i guess it it was it actually it looks like it was just called u.s array okay. okay it was part of sorry it wasn't part of earth cube it was part of earth scope earth scope that's yeah sorry earth cube earth scope got all these names 
There is some Earth Cube stuff out there because I googled it too to see what this yeah, thing was. Earth Scope, okay. Yeah, Earth Cube is like they do funding of stuff. It looks like the array they're in, they're doing stuff in Alaska now. That's cool. Anywho, um, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. So there's other two stories here, <laughs> both deal with um, plate tectonics in terms of uh, heat. And so the first one deals with uh, these, these folks um, in France modeled up plate tectonic movement. So one of the things, one of the unknowns with plate tectonics is, you know, we can see it, we have an understanding of, of how it works. You know, at mid-ocean ridges, you have new material that comes up and it gets near the surface and it me melts through decompression and that pushes the, the older plate away. So you have a slab um, or you have ridge push and then at subduction, it's pulling the plate down and it's, it's due to gravity. You have buoyancy of the, the molten material floating to the surface and the cold dense stuff sinking down. And so you have this ridge push slab pool sort of mechanism. Mm -hmm. One of the unknowns is, is exactly what's happening in the mantle and, and how you're getting, how convection is going, how it's, it's sort of churning, if it's a single churn or if there's multiple layers of sort of convection. Um, and so people are, are, are trying to look at this and trying to model it. And one of the, this study does not answer that. Um, so I guess real, real, real so, fast, let, let, let's, let's yeah. stop you for a second. So just in case for the uh, listeners out there that don't understand the convection of what's going on in the earth's mantle. Um, so the earth's mantle is, you get the, the crust on the outside, obviously, and the next layer down inside the earth is the earth's mantle. And that's like, that's the biggest layer on the inside of the earth. And yeah. it's solid, but it acts like a plastic, right? And so the, the heat from the core of the earth, um, it causes these convection cells inside the earth's mantle. So kind of what's happening is the, earth, the, the earth's mantle is acting like a giant lava lamp, right? So in the lava lamp, you have the lava's not, there's not actual lava inside your lava lamp. I'm sorry. What? It's, I, I'm sorry. That's, I just You're ruined Steve's me, night. I've touched the lamps before and they feel like they're a thousand degrees. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> so you have, it's actually wax. So I'm very sorry about that, uh, gentlemen. So mm. your heat source of your lava lamp is a light bulb. All right. And the wax, usually when you, when you start up your lava lamp, it takes like 45 minutes or so for it to kick in, right? Melts the wax, right? And as it heats up, it becomes less dense or more buoyant and floats up. It, you get this upwelling, comes up to the top. Now when that, that wax is at the top of your lava lamp, it's far away from your heat source, it starts to cool down, it starts to become more dense. And that, right? that's also less the reason for the shape too. What shape, what do you mean? Oh, the shape of the it, lava it lamp? Get, yeah, it gets pointier to the tops, which in, increases its surface area, which cools it down faster. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah. Look at you pulling that out of it. Wow, look at that. That's, that's why I'm here, gentlemen. Lava, <laughs> lava lamp lava statistics. <laughs> it was my, I worked for four years as a lava lamp technician <laughs> until the market collapsed. Yeah, the market yeah. collapsed when they There's, used uh, LED light bulbs. <laughs> There's no more heat. <laughs> the 80s hit, people stopped buying lava lamps. Um, all right, so the stuff's at the top. It cools down. Uh, it becomes more more dense, less buoyant, and so, anyways, you get this this circular, this uh, this it's called convection cells. This, this these convection currents, and so that's kind of the breakdown. It's a very watered down breakdown of what's going on inside the Earth's mantle. It's not as simple as that, but that that gives you at least a good visual on how this is kind of churning around inside that mantle. So, all right, Jesse, this, this is a this is this is a good episode if you're listening it, to. Uh check us out on YouTube and you'll see all the hand motions. Oh yeah. I'm just going all over the place right now. I, but I just, I'm, I'm doing it without thought. Like uh, just, it's the way you have to explain it. So <clears throat> this um, study, they, they were looking at, uh, so it's, it's basically saying like, you know, trying to analyze the asthenosphere, this, this, the, the part of the mantle that you were talking about, that's plastic 
and it's sort of like a semi-solid in that it's solid, but it's mobile. I always think about it like being like squishy wax. Like wax, if you get it, if you heat it up, it's, you know, you could, you could poke your finger into it and it sort of deforms, but it's still solid. If you keep heating it, it would turn into liquid and that's, that's like molten rock. So the mm -hmm. asthenosphere to me is like, it's like hot wax, but not, not melty wax. I, and I like I that analogy it. better because, you know, when people say plastic, it's like, well, what do you mean? What exactly does that mean? So I like your uh, warm wax analogy. I think we all have the experience of like poking a can of wax, right? I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Nope. I've um, done it. So anywho, the, uh, these researchers were using seismic tomography to sort of map out the, the asthenosphere. And what they started noticing <clears throat> was, was at the boundary basically of the, of the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. So the lithosphere is what makes up the plates of plate tectonics and the asthenosphere is that mobile part that we're talking about that that's acting as like the conveyor belt that's pushing the plates along. And here they, they were seeing seismic waves were, were attenuating and like changing their speed essentially, which means they were hitting uh, material that that had a different composition of the surrounding okay. material um and basically what it works out to is that there's this the, this small amount of molten material so these little like blobs or these layers of molten material um and it's it's very small like less than a percent by volume tiny amount but it's not where you would expect them. I mean, like it wasn't under the ridges or it wasn't under hot spots. It was just under the oceanic plates, basically where the plates are meeting the asthenosphere. And so it's acting like as this, like it, it decoupled them from the, the, the underlying mantle. So almost acting like a lubricant? Yeah. And so they're, they're thinking this is, this actually is part of the reason the plates move ocean plates especially move so freely uh, like when the when the when you, when you get um new material coming up the mid-ocean ridge it pushes the older ocean crust away and it 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 does this pretty easily if you think about how it's opening oceans up yeah i mean the pacific rise is moving at what like 14 centimeters a year and which so is the, a lot like that's like you know again if you're watching it on youtube like this much. This much. There you go. <laughs> the amount of molten it. rock they found is higher in areas with the fastest moving plates. Ah, so more lubricant, faster moving. Mo there you go. Yep. Sure enough. Wow. Slippy, slippy, dippy, moving faster. So you got it. Yeah. Grease in the wheels of plate tectonics. I love it. Driving like a bat out of Hades. <laughs> <laughs> Straight out of uh, the underworld there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that was, that was really cool. That was yeah, really cool. That's... All right. So I guess uh, I, got, I got one news story I'd like to talk about today. And I'll make this kind of brief because I know I, we were running a little, little low on time here. Sorry, but... My bad. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. We're having fun here. You know, just hanging out, you know, talking about geology. I, I can't think of a better way to spend my Wednesday night. Absolutely not. This is it. This is this is as good as it gets. All right. So, I, hump day. I want to. I, <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's. Uh, so this this one new story I want to talk about talks about the. Uh, it was a little redundant there. Um, talks about the Permian Triassic uh, mass extinction event. And so this we've talked about this a uh, few times on the podcast, but this is the most. Uh, this was like the worst of the worst of the mass extinction events. So when this happened, so this happened at uh, 252 million years ago, and 96% of all marine life died off. And uh, it was this was just you know you might th you know a lot of a lot of people think like the the mass extinction event that took out the dinosaurs was like the worst. Actually, I was just telling my girlfriend about this today because 
This Ooh. is what we talk about now. Uh, <laughs> she was intrigued by this. No, she, she thought, like, you know, I think a lot of people out there think that the mass extinction event that took out the dinosaurs was like the worst. And I was explained to her today, I was like, no, 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 no. This one, the, the Permian Triassic extinction event, this is like the worst of the worst. It's, it's she, literally nicknamed the Great Dying. I, so I was just about to say, the Great oh, Dying. Shit. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Sorry. Chris, she is a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> that's all i would say listen to me talk about the, the, the mass extinction event <laughs> anyways um so when you whenever you're studying these mass extinction events it's really really hard to pin down what was the cause or the like the quote like smoking gun and sometimes it, it was it may not have even been one variable you know it, it could have uh could have been multiple variables Especially the further you go back in time, the more yeah. blurry that evidence gets. Exactly. And, and exactly. It, yeah. So we're dealing with a quarter of a billion years ago. All right. That's, that's a long time ago. I mean, so anyways, it's, yeah. So there's a couple uh, suspects on a couple of hypotheses on what, what could have caused this mass extinction event. Um, and there's a new paper that just, just came out, I think like about two days on the 19th, uh, two days ago in Nature Geoscience. Uh, they ran some, uh, did some modeling um, and they feel that it was volcanisms, volcanoes um, going off in what in a region or um, a, what formed a geologic feature that we call the Siberian traps. So it was this inc incredible amount of volcanism and it released a lot of co2 into the atmosphere and it kind of what happened was you got this like runaway reaction uh, this literally a domino effect that um that started occurring and just pff, everything got taken out so what they did to do this model was they looked at some fossil brachiopods so if you don't know what a brachiopod is um they're these little fossils. They, they almost look like clam shells. They're not. They're not clams at all. They're not. But they, um, and a lot of these things became extinct at this at this extinction event, 250 uh, million years ago, 252 million years ago, and what they were able to do was they they kind of looking at these uh, these brachiopods they picked out from in the Alps, which coincidentally is not, you know the um, Obviously, those mountains sticking up are, you know. Well, that's obviously how they anymore. died. They yeah, weren't they got, in the they, ocean exactly, anymore. Exactly, right? <laughs> um, no, I think, it's, I, I think that's, that's, that's really interesting. You know, the, you have this, these marine rocks that make up the Alps. You know, you can be on a, a peak on the Alps, and it's, you have fossils. You have marine fossils in these things. So, okay, so they analyzed these, these brachiopod fossils, and they found there was a increase of uh, carbon and just by looking at the the chemical signature within these brachiopods these uh these researchers were able to figure out what was going on with your carbon dioxide levels all right so carbon dioxide levels went up um, and climate started warming and this wasn't good for for the life on in the ocean uh as a result uh kind of like one one runaway effect after another the ocean started when it turned into these um they went anoxic or lacking oxygen and uh it was just really bad for life and it took out it ended up taking out 96 percent of life in the oceans so anyways so the 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 this new story in nature geoscience was saying like hey we ran this model and this model saying it most likely was or that's what they're hypothesizing right that it was most likely these volcanoes that caused it because the other another leading hypothesis for what could have taken out all of this life during this mass extinction event was uh these things called methane hydrates or uh kind of like Cla calathrates yeah this this uh this mass release of, of of methane from the ocean and uh i don't get too much into the nitty-gritty about that but it happens sometimes the the missions are right where the oceans just kind of release all this methane methane's a greenhouse gas and that can be a driver to heat up the earth so anyway these guys are saying like ah, we don't think it was the methane we think it was it was the, the increased uh volcanic activity uh, in this area that we call the, the siberian traps oh. 
<clears throat> See, when you first described this before we came on, I thought you were saying it was the cloud, right? <clears throat> no, no, that was, that was the competing hypothesis. Yeah. Ah. I, I think we'll just mention real quick. So the clathrate is just, it's the, the methane molecule is trapped by <clears throat> ice in these little cages of ice that's in the seafloor sediment. And so if you heat it up, the ice melts, or you do it, one of the thoughts is we're seeing these big um, subsidence events in Siberia today. Have you seen those? Maybe we'll talk about those at a later date. Oh, yeah. yes, I have. I was gonna talk about that for a news story, but we ran out of time. I've never, I wasn't able to. You wanna save it for next time? Yeah, yeah or maybe, talk, we're, maybe, talking about, no, we're talking about Siberia right now, go ahead. So, so these methane are basically in these ice cages, and if you heat it up enough that the ice melts, that gas then gets liberated and just it diffuses because it's a gas. Bloop, bloop. And so you're, you're seeing it, it, it can release all of this methane at once in the sea. And it, it, the thought is that it could turn the sea, you know, sulf, sulfuric or sulfitic. But uh, in Siberia, you're seeing it in the permafrost and it's basically destabilizing the ground. So all the gas releases and the, the ice melts. And so you get these big subsidence, these big slumps they almost look like craters. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's it's like a bubble bursting yeah. and they're just collapsing. Yeah. Love to I'd love to see that real time happen. Like No, that's terrifying. From a distance. Yeah. From a distance. Could you imagine if you're like barbecuing in Siberia and all of a sudden a methane burp happens? I don't think we're doing much <laughs> barbecuing in Siberia. Why not? It's cold. Well I would I wouldn't want to be outside. More, <laughs> all the more reason to barbecue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're barbecuing and all this methane comes out. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> just poops. Yeah, right? Yeah. Fireball. I hope you like your steak well done. <laughs> yeah, it's like something out of a cartoon where you just turn into like black smoke. and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No more eyebrows. Yep, exactly. So, very cool. Yeah, so I guess uh, I got nothing else to say. Anybody else have anything else to say? I think I- I want to say uh, thanks to all our listeners. We're we're up to several hundred downloads per episode. We we have lots of subscribers. Uh, not enough Patreons, but you know we're getting there. So thanks. Yeah, thanks to everyone for uh, subscribes to the podcast. Uh, yeah, so if uh, if you want to help out the podcast, if you if you like if you enjoy listen to the flannel cast and uh and, and if, if you'd like to help out you could subscribe to us on patreon we have uh, several different tiers or plans monthly plans for support starting off at two dollars a month um two dollars that's it just two dollars a month that's man that's almost free eight yeah. quarters that's that's single coffee once a month but you know whatever you want to give whatever you want to give whatever you're comfortable with just add in zero to it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's times it by 10. So, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, if you, uh, or other ways, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, subscribe to us on, um, you know, I guess you may already have subscribed for any, you know, we're on your, any uh, uh, podcast platform, whatever you use to search for your podcast, we're out there. Uh, we have a YouTube page. Check us out. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Tell some friends. Uh, Steve has some, kind of uh yeah tell eight friends for october, in october. Eight, eight friends in october yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, if you even though it's the 10th month so you should sell, tell 10 friends but we talked about this with it's the third week in a row calendar now. yeah 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 hey, you know i'm still upset two thousand years later <laughs> no i guess not two thousand was it i don't know how old are 600 you 600 years when, when do we start going to the when did we switch from the Gregorian to the was I don't know. Four, 14 something? Anyway. I study the rocks, man. I don't study the calendars. That, that's true. Yeah. We're, we're on the 600 geologic years timescale. geologically is nothing, right? Yeah. 15, anyway. 1582. All right. Let's just put it this way. Tell eight to 10 friends. How's that? <laughs> All right. There you go. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, if, uh, and like I just want to promote, uh, if you want to – if you have any geology questions you'd like us to answer on the podcast, go to our website, geologyflannelcast.com and uh, submit a geology question. Um, we'd love to do another listener question episode soon. And we've just haven't been getting around to talking to, I, you know, advertising that on the podcast. So, but yeah. yeah, let's, let's get those listener questions up and running again. That'll be a lot of fun to uh, do another episode of those. 
Right. Always and the, fa- the fastest way to get your listener question up on a podcast is to be a Patreon. Uh, <laughs> certain, certain tier levels get to get to demand certain crazy things of us. Like next yeah. week, Chris has the podcast with his shirt off. So, Oh, really? This is, yeah. This is oh, uh, we forgot. Jesse and I forgot uh, to tell you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you watch our subscribership's going to go through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> we tried it once where i took my shirt off nobody nobody watched we lost so. subscribers actually <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's like, so. it's like it's one of those things i started smoking the number of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh good times it's funny because it's true um, anyway uh, uh yeah so, so check us out yeah uh, we're on facebook follow us on facebook uh, uh geology flannel cast uh we're on twitter at geo flannel cast that's the only one that's different and uh the patreon website if you want to go to the patreon website to help us out it's patreon.com slash geology flannel cast um so yeah thanks everyone for uh listening go um anything else no a little shout out to mark and frank they actually hooked us up with a ton of uh information on the fly yeah. for, for our two patreons there so thank you guys yeah yeah thanks guys and uh all right so uh thanks to everyone listening we love you guys um take care have a good one and we'll see you guys next week with the next episode bye take care bye